you wonderful scuba divers out there. Welcome to Scuba Diver Magazine and welcome to Ask Mark, uh, which is my scuba diving Q&A. Uh, if you do have any questions, pop them down in the comments below. And if you use the Ask Mark hashtag, it gets featured in an upcoming Q&A. This week, I'm answering questions about clean air fills on cylinders, if your cylinders are O2 cleaned. Uh, three grand cold water suit budget, awesome. Um, first stage repairs and what goes on, redundancy setups in regulators, and advanced dive computer recommendations. Let's dive straight in with the first question which this week comes from Nathan Phillips and they say hey Mark after I have O2 cleaned my tank can I fill it with air instead without losing the O2 certify certification uh, or must the tank only be used with nitrox to keep the O2 cleaned certificate um, so this is quite an interesting question no you can fill it with 21 percent but there's there's two different like grades i mean there's more than two but at most dive centers there's two grades of air you get standard air which will go through a couple of filters it comes straight out of the compressor and it's just filled into the cylinder unless they're using banks or something but when you have a, a nitrox stickered cylinder it gets filled with clean air so it's gone through extra filters that helps with your o2 cleaning um, but it's still just 21 percent oxygen or 20.9 percent wherever you are um, but yes you can fill it with just normal air but it does have to be clean air and it often costs a little bit more because it's going through extra filters so it costs the dive center a little bit more but yes, you can dive it with air. It doesn't have to be nitrox every single time, um, but it does have to be clean air because strictly, and it probably depends on which country you're from, but strictly, if you do have a nitrox stickered up cylinder and then you fill it with like regular air, then you should really lose that certificate as it were um, because of just a few extra contaminants and stuff. Um, but to answer your question yes you can dive it with regular air it's just clean air is required Cordy O'Neill says, Hi Mark, looking at starting UK diving, uh, will just be summer diving, to start down the technical and cave diving route. I have around £3,000 budget for dry suit, gloves, boots, undersuit, etc. What would you recommend? Or would the Apex Semi-Dry be good enough for summer UK diving? Yeah, uh, more than enough for, uh, for UK. Uh, put it in perspective, I, I mean, right now I tend to drive my uh, my dry suit year round here in the UK. Uh, I just find it a bit more civilized. Um, but I would wear a five mil in the summertime here in the UK, uh, probably without gloves as well. I don't remember always wearing gloves in the summertime. I one of my um, one of the guys I used to dive with, he used to wear or he definitely did wear on one particular dive a two and a half mil shorty here in the UK. Now that was in a uh, in a reservoir, uh, relatively shallow dive, uh, and that was in like the heat of summer, I imagine. Um, but yeah, he's a bit of a, a mad lad. Um, so you don't necessarily need to go down like eight mil route, I wouldn't worry too much, but thermic would be a great choice. Uh, the semi-dry, 8 mil is a good thickness as well so that will do your summer time but it will also like extend your boundaries to like getting into autumn and a bit of that early spring as well um, but realistically a dry suit uh, if you are if you do have that 3k um, and it can be allocated towards uh, like thermal protection for a dry suit then yeah it would open up doors and it would be much more flexible uh, especially going forwards especially going into sort of cave diving and technical as well so there are what three kind of sections you've got the dry suit itself you've got your undersuit and then your accessories like your hoods and your gloves and things uh, the good news is that most dry suits come with a hood normally like a five mil hood and it's sized to it's sized proportionally with the dry suit so if you buy a small dry suit you tend to get a small hood or something that should fit you um, so you don't necessarily have to worry about investing in a hood because they tend to come with the dry suit uh, boots are of course attached to the bottom of the dry suit so you don't have to worry about them uh, gloves however in the summertime three mil gloves is really all you need uh, you just need a, a layer over your uh, your hands and that's even three mil will give you a um, a decent amount of insulation five mil is going to give you a bit more 
temperature range, but then you're starting to lose dexterity. You can still do things in the water, but it's a bit more clumsy. Seven mil is real like Arctic. Um, that's what I was wearing up in the Arctic, those like lobster mitt claws. And yeah, your hands, you, you kind of resign those when you're um, wearing seven mil mitts. Um, so personally, I usually recommend dry gloves or at least looking at dry gloves because a lot of them nowadays integrate into dry suits really easily and some you can buy with them fitted onto your dry suit when they're new. So there's my two favorites right now are Waterproof Ultima because they fit quite a lot of different dry suits because most dry suits use Cytec cuff ring systems uh, when you've got silicone cuffs fitted to, uh, to dry suits and the Ultima is sort of made in collaboration so you just pop the uh, the Cytec ring out and then fit Ultima into it and no tools it just clicks into position you can dive it with the dry gloves you can dive it without the dry gloves just with bare hands um, it, it's very easy or the other um, popular one nowadays is QB uh, spelled with a K uh, metal ring system it can fit onto latex cuffs and I think it can fit on some neoprene cuffs, but it has to be a certain thickness and it is, gets really muddy. Whereas um, if you can have them factory fitted, it's usually the best option. Uh, Retrofitting, it, it can be a bit of a pain because you have to flip it inside out and it is, it's, it's a lot of fiddling. Um, but they're gonna set you back 150 quid um, ballpark. Um, expect to go like a little bit higher as well just in case you have to get the because um, you don't always get the actual glove itself you just get the ring system you then have to buy the gloves on top of that um, but yeah I, like three mil gloves 40 quid uh, five mil gloves 50 60 quid um, and then yeah dry gloves if you really want to like expand your horizons about 150 plus uh, as far as undersuit two different layers of undersuit. Uh, you need a base layer, or ideally you have a base layer that goes against your skin, thinking something like Fourth Element J2. 150 quid, 200 quid. Um, there, there are a few out there. I think Waterproof do one, I think they just call it the base. Um, I think Scuba Pro do a new one. I can't remember what it's called. Uh, Apex has just released a new one that I, I haven't seen yet. Um, but yeah, you're talking about 150, 200 quid for, uh, for a base layer. An undersuit is arguably more important. The undersuit is what's actually keeping you warm. Their base layer is just what's like wicking moisture away from your skin. Um, your undersuit, 200 pounds to 500 plus because you get like basic dry suits uh, sorry dry suit undersuits and then you can get like fancy ones like fourth elements halo ar which has special mesh panels and um and like argon infused things so it's much more um insulating you can get electronically heated undersuits as well this is all a bit much for like summer diving most summer divers just have like a base layer and then a thin dry suit undersuit something like santi flex 190 uh, or a fourth element probably zero therm depending on the uh, the dry suit that you're wearing you just need a little bit of a something i mean when i was diving in my um uh my neoprene dry suit i probably would just wear a flannel shirt like this in the summertime and that would be fine just for basic training uh, teaching dives um if you're actually on like a proper expedition it's worth getting an actual undersuit because they are made to wick moisture and they're just much more efficient than just flannel but um yeah it's it's an option for you uh then getting down the um the dry suit range yeah, I mean, just off the rack standard sizes. Waterproof D1X, 2,600 pounds. That's probably like upper limit uh, on like expensive dry suits and most other dry suits are below that. But bear in mind that D1X has a built-in undersuit. So you can take some money out of that budget and put that into the dry suit. All you have to wear is just a base layer underneath that. Um, or something a bit lighter, waterproof D3. Uh, the Ergo, that's uh, just shy of two grand. Uh, Santi dry suits, top-notch dry suits nowadays. Uh, the E-Lite, the E-Motion, they, they'll set you back about two grand as well. Fourth Element Argonaut, like I use about, 
think that's about north of 2k. Uh, DUI, Otter, uh, O3, Northern Diver, all good, good dry suits. Um, yeah, it's it is tough to recommend dry suits for uh, for other people without like meeting them and talking it through but uh, but those would be my kind of choices um but yeah three gate three k is a uh, a pretty good um you, you're going to get a good dry suit out of that so um yeah i'll be looking at like santi level dry suit get something really good that will um will last you years and years and years and then just bulk up the undersuit underneath it as you uh, as you progress and um, sort of start to go deeper and longer. Philip Lucky says, what is done and replaced when you have a service done on regulator, first stages, etc.? Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I answered a very similar question to this um, last week, but when you um, when you take your regulators in for a service, uh, just two random things. Um, they basically pull everything apart. Um, I, I can probably do a little bit. Um, I, I went over it in a greater detail last week, uh, so I'll put a link up here. But basically, they pull everything apart uh, that they can. They're, they're inspecting everything from wear and tear and any kind of damage. And, um, and then on the inside, we, they, they continue to, uh, to disassemble. And there are certain sealing surfaces and O-rings and gaskets and diaphragms that need to be replaced because most regulators will have a, uh, a service kit which comes from the manufacturer. Uh, I'll need tools to, uh, to pull that apart. But you, you disassemble it and then the, um, you go through the service kit and that has all of the replacement O-rings all then they're not laid out they're usually in a little bag and that's everything that you need to replace that first stage or that second stage or some of them nowadays are going down the route of a universal service kit so you just buy this service kit and it can um it can service all of their second stages um but yeah it's just a bag of, of o-rings gaskets uh ceiling surfaces uh i think i've taken it upstairs but you get these ceiling surfaces, especially in second stages on the uh, on the poppet, and um, and yeah, you, you just sort of swap those over. Anything that can go in an ultrasonic bath goes in an ultrasonic bath um, to uh, to clean up any um, uh, like build up on it, get them nice and clean, and then the um, the the regulator technician just replaces everything, puts it back together, um, and then fits it all back together. They uh, they then balance it all, and um, and then hand it back to you um, but that's basically it so um, yeah everything gets disassembled all the way we inspect everything we're looking for like tears and uh, and any rips and things and diaphragms and um, yeah anything that's any kind of damage that's suspicious uh, but otherwise yeah you replace those o-rings and then it all gets put back together Mojo Stone or Moho Stone, depending on where you're from, says, Hello, Mark. I am an extremely light breather. I breathe normally to, my, uh, to me and do not hold my breath. Good. Uh, I'm extremely relaxed in the water, as we all should be. Uh, I was in a situation where I could have been required to supply air to two divers. During my next dives in February, I'll calculate my dive buddies and my sack and RMV rates. My dive buddy is the very opposite. He's a heavy breather. Um, even before this situation, I'd already bought a two meter long hose for my tropical back plate and wing rig. Unfortunately, we were diving in rental gear and no computers were available. It's true, red flag. Um, if you thought there was a good chance that two divers would need to share your air, how would you configure your regulators and hose lengths? All four of my scuba rigs have high quality opto regulators and either air two or SS one, I believe in redundancy. Uh, also, during every dive, I swap between all three second stages. Uh, that seems a bit much um, to, to swap between each year. Second stages is good to make sure they work, but I don't think I do it on every single dive. Um, so in the unlikely events that you would have to donate to two separate divers, so you have three divers breathing off a single cylinder, um, or what would be the best setup? I mean, the best setup would be with side mounted cylinders. Uh, so you have completely redundant air supplies um, because 
as soon as you start adding more second stages and demand valves, remember all of that gas is coming through a single first stage and some first stages can get overwhelmed. Uh, others can't, they're, they're designed for it. If you look at the um, Mars Abyss, I think that was one of the, the 52, the 52 first stage, they, they literally had that and it was, I can't remember whether they were trying to make a world record or attempt or whether they were just testing to see if it, it could happen. Uh, but they had, I forget the number, but a lot of divers. I think it was almost three figures, like a hundred scuba divers all breathing off a single first stage just to prove its, its performance. Um, but with some first stages, yeah, as soon as you start adding two and three and four second stages and someone inhales all at the same time, that's a lot of airflow for um, uh, for that first stage, so it can limit its uh, its performance. But yeah, uh, best possible uh, option is independent cylinders, so that everyone gets their own first stage with a, uh, a second stage. But if you're like renting, you're only diving on a single cylinder. Your best possible uh, like dual donation setup would be. Um, so you're limited to a single first stage. I'd have that two meter long hose uh, so that you can long hose primary donate. So that's donation number one set up. And then you're breathing from your alternate, which is on a, a shorter hose that just pops over your shoulder. Um, th that's like 60 centimeters long. Um, and then you said you've already had your um, your Air 2 or your your SS1, which is a, a regulator built into your um, uh, inflator hose on your BCD. So then you donate your secondary. Uh, Diver 3 has to basically hug your right hand shoulder so that you can breathe from your uh, from your BCD inflator. And then they're breathing just over your um, your right hand shoulder. That probably is your best setup. Um, if you're just diving from a single cylinder, I mean, it's highly unlikely. Uh, it's rare to get two simultaneous failures at any great depth. Um, it's quite unusual. Um, but yeah, I can imagine some situations in which, yeah, you might have to donate to, uh, to two separate um, divers, but that that would be a legitimate uh, sort of way of doing it. Otherwise, it comes down to buddy breathing and just passing a, a second stage backwards and forwards to to limit the amount of work that your first stage has to go through. It's an interesting thought experiment, um, but yeah, I, I think you're pretty well there with the most efficient um, regulator setup. Two meter long hose or 2.1 meter, I think most are a, um, a like 60 centimeter alternate. And yeah, you've got that uh, inflator as well to, uh, to breathe from. But yeah, if you can, and you, you are expecting this kind of situation, I'd have twins and a, a side mounted cylinder uh, just to have a bit of extra redundancy. Santi Fernandez says, hi Mark, difficult question. I've been diving with an old computer that a friend gave me a while ago, but it's time to get something a bit better. I'm still on open circuit, but I'm sure I want to follow the rebreather route on the next two or three years. I also do other sports and actually I'm starting to need a triathlon watch as well. So shall I invest in a Perdix 2, knowing that when I eventually get a rebreather, I'll have something Oh, sorry, I'll have to buy something similar again or pay to get it hardwired or should I aim for something like a Peregrine and spend big money on a new one when I purchase the rebreather? Or should I ditch the idea of a diving dedicated computer and look for something like the Descent, uh, sorry, the Garmin Descent Mark II that I'll use on my other sports as well or are there any other ideas? It's a huge investment and it'll be even bigger in a few years time. Yeah, it will if you're buying a rebreather. Uh, so I'm quite undecided on what way I should follow. Uh, thanks for the help and congrats for the good work. You are welcome. So uh, my first instinct is the Garmin Descent because you have your triathlon work as well. And if you go down the Perdix route at this point, then yeah, it'll be a good dive computer, but in two or three years time when you go down the rebreather route your it does have a, a ccr mode a closed circuit rebreather mode but it's it won't be 
it'll just be a, a fixed PPO2. So it'll be like guesstimation. And it'll give you semi-accurate information, but most rebreathers come with their own dive computer and some actually use sheer water dive computers. It's usually the, uh, the petrol because the petrol body has enough space for that like cable fitting, like a Fisher fitting or something. Whereas the Perdix is uh, a bit slimmer, so it doesn't actually have the, the literal space to fit that extra fitting into it. Um, so you'll find that most actual integrated shear water computers are the petrol. Um, the, the Peregrine, yeah, the Peregrine, you could use that as a, um, a an open circuit dive computer now, and then just turn it into gauge mode down the road. But again, that's not gonna help with your triathlon work. So yeah, my, my instinct would be to go down the, the descent route because that has, I mean, that's a beast of a dive computer. It has everything that you could possibly need and more. It's got so many modes in it uh, that you'll probably never even use, but it has everything that you do for scuba and technical diving and your triathlon work. So I'd go down the, the descent route and then when it comes to investing in a rebreather, you can use that. And you can also use the, um, uh, uh, the Garmin Descent for like technical diving. I know uh, Divers Ready, he took one down and, uh, and did some pretty advanced technical diving with it. And it, it keeps up, they, um, the, they have worked quite hard on the, the technical deeper side. Um, but I imagine it's also, I think it's also got a gauge mode as well. So yeah, it is gonna, is going to suit your needs and that's probably the most efficient way of um, uh, investing in computers going forwards and that's it um, for another week uh, again another quick one i'm trying to make them as succinct as possible so i don't ramble on too much as i often do uh, i do enjoy talking about scuba diving but if you've got any scuba diving questions again gear recommendations um, because i have managed to uh, get my hands on most of the stuff on the uh, on the scene at the moment so um, yeah if you need me to compare and contrast anything in particular uh, let me know and uh, if you want me to elaborate on it on the, uh, the on the next show use the ask mark hashtag and uh, and I'll find it behind the scenes. Um, yeah, like, share, subscribe. Please remember to do all the uh, like social media stuff because it helps us in the algorithm that we all must obey on YouTube. Uh, it just helps us grow as ever. Um, but yeah, thanks for watching everybody. And of course, safe diving.